Hello, and welcome to World History with Professor Roll. Our topic today is a foundational introduction to history, archaeology, and the past. And our aim is to provide some clear definition and distinguish between these terms, to clear up some common misconceptions about them, and to outline some key elements of historical thinking. I'm your host, Dr. Daryl Roll, former trash man, lumberjack, and IT consultant, but now a professor of history, archaeology, and digital humanities at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. You may be watching or listening to this because you're enrolled in one of my courses. Another teacher or professor may have assigned or recommended this, or you may have just stumbled upon it due to a personal interest in history and or archaeology. Whatever the reason, I'm happy to welcome you. I hope that you'll find this interesting and worthwhile. So, again, our topic today is defining and distinguishing between those terms history, archaeology, and the past, and highlighting and correcting some common misconceptions and outlining key elements of how historians approach our work. Please note that this is not at all designed to be a comprehensive guide to history or the historical method, and that some historians will, no doubt, find something here that they disagree with or wish that I hadn't overly simplified. And that's okay with me. Good historians and history teachers disagree all the time. And this episode is simply designed as an initial launching pad into a deeper and more critical engagement with history and historical thinking. There will be some brief discussion of archaeology here, but for this episode, we're mostly concerned with history. And I'll offer a more direct introduction to archaeology in a future separate episode. Now today, the first thing I want to deal with is the important difference between history and the past, which are frequently confused with that word history often being used when people are really referring to the past. Let's start by thinking about time. Now let me first say that the nature of time does remain a significant matter of debate with really interesting ideas and complications thrown around by both philosophers and physicists. And time can be viewed as linear, cyclical, or even as an illusion altogether. And I'm aware of and really fascinated by these debates. And I do personally enjoy thinking through various possibilities about time as part of my own theoretical work in archaeology. For now, though, we're going to assume a basically linear view of time. And if we think about time as something that is constantly moving, we can break it down into three separate units. The past, the present, and the future. And we, we live here in the present, the here and the now. And because time is constantly moving, The present is ever-changing from now to new now. And the past is composed of everything, every event, and every moment that has ever existed or ever happened, all the way from the very beginning of time, if there is such a thing as a beginning of time up until this very moment. The past, therefore, includes that moment in which our planet was created or came into being, when the dinosaurs walked the earth, when human beings first developed speech, and when people first migrated to the new world, as well as much more recent things as Donald Trump's inauguration last week's mac and cheese dinner, and my morning cup of tea. And even just one minute ago, when I told you that 
The past is composed of everything, every event, and every moment that has ever existed or ever happened, all the way from the very beginning of time up until this very moment. So, when I began this episode, I was beginning it in what had been our present, but which is now our past. And because I'm still speaking, we must assume that this episode will continue into time that we haven't yet experienced. And this is what we call the future. But while that time remains the future to us now, it will be the present to us when we experience it. And it will then become the past once that particular moment is over. So the present is the here and now, the right here and the right now. And this is where we perpetually live. We cannot go back to the past. And while we may be seen as moving forward into the future, we never really reach the future because the future lies just outside of our experience as a set of possibilities beyond the present. And even though we might move forward in time, we move forward with the present, bringing it along with us. Or perhaps the present brings us along with it. And from this perspective, the past is gone. It is something, indeed it is everything, that has already happened. For better or worse, we can't go back to the past. We cannot change it. We cannot correct its wrongs. And this can sometimes be painful as we remember the past and the things we've done. Maybe the things we didn't do, but wish we had done. Or the things done to us. Or we might look back on loved ones or particular experiences and wish that we could just have one more chance to see them. Or experience that again. But the reality is that we can't. And as that wise sage Elsa of Arendelle has wisely noted, the past is in the past. But even though we live perpetually in the present and we work to achieve the dreams that we may have for the future, the past is constantly growing, and is, it is inhabited by memories and experiences, and by the people, places, things, and events of every new moment that passes in time, and that have led to this very moment. For these reasons, the past is of utmost importance to the present, and both history and archaeology are particularly focused upon the past. Confusingly, though, people often use the word history when what they really mean is the past. History is not, though, the things that have happened in the past. And it's not the same thing as the past itself. Old times are not history. Last week is not history. These are best referred to as the past. History, on the other hand, is perhaps, perhaps best defined as humanity's documentation of the past. It is what we say about the past, the things we choose to record, and the perspectives with which we present the particular elements of the past that we find worth passing along. History is also an academic study of the past that seeks to create new accounts of the past based upon the documentary evidence that is available for the past. And archaeology, on the other hand, is also concerned with the past, but it creates its accounts and understandings of the past primarily based on the physical or material evidence that is left behind. Although this sometimes includes documentary materials, most of the archaeological record consists of the leftover remains of human activities, the stuff that we make 
use and dispose of as we carry out our lives. And if you're interested for more about archaeology, do check back because I'm absolutely going to be including several episodes on archaeology, archaeological work, archaeological thought. So where do we stand so far? First, history and the past are not the same things, although we do commonly use the word history when what we really do mean is the past. And in this episode, we broadly defined the past as anything and everything that has ever existed and or happened from the very beginning of time all the way up to this very moment. Now, although history isn't the same thing as the past, history and the past are closely connected because history is humanity's documentation of the past. History is not a true reflection of the past because it is selective and limited by all sorts of factors. And we're going to explore some of those factors in this episode, and we'll come to see some of these limitations in more depth as we explore particular aspects of world history in future episodes in this series. So, now that we've made that crucial distinction between the concepts of history and the past, I want us to have a brief critical thinking moment about another very common saying, that someone who has done something remarkable has made history. Now this phrase has been used a lot in recent months. There's been, for example, a lot of talk about the history-making aspects of our current COVID-19 pandemic. But two other recent examples are really worth highlighting here. And they, these both relate to the February 2020 Super Bowl. Now, following the Kansas City Chiefs win over the San Francisco 49ers in Super Bowl 54, hundreds of headlines proclaimed that Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes had made history as the youngest player to ever win both the NFL Super Bowl um, and the NFL's most valuable player in the same year. And similarly, Katie Sowers, an offensive assistant coach for the 49ers, was said to have made history as both the first woman and openly LGBT coach at a Super Bowl. And in both the cases of Mahomes and Sowers, hundreds of headlines and many thousands of social media commentators remarked about the history-making accomplishments of these two remarkable individuals. But based upon the way that we've just distinguished between the past and history, did Mahomes and Sowers really make history? Let's think about that for a minute. Certainly, they are remarkable people who accomplished remarkable things. But if history is humanity's documentation of the past, it is not necessarily those people who do remarkable things that make history, but it's those people who do the remarking about those things that were so remarkable. In the case of Mahomes and Sowers, then, the people who've more properly made history are all the journalists, photographers, TV analysts, and even those social media commentators who documented those accomplishments. In a very real way, you and I have just as much ability to make history, especially in our current digital world, as anyone who achieves remarkable things. Yes, remarkable people may often be the subjects of history, but the real history makers are those who do the documentation, whether that's by writing about, photographing, filming, or otherwise recording events, things, thoughts, and responses to what's happening in our world today. 
So now that we can distinguish between history and the past, and we can explain how history is made not so much by remarkable people doing remarkable things, but by often ordinary people recording or otherwise documenting both the remarkable and ordinary aspects of human experience. What more can we say about how we think about history and how we evaluate all of the various sources that are available to us as we think about the past? Well, I think that the Stanford History Education Group has outlined a very good yet simple set of reading skills that form the basis of much historical thinking. And I'd like to conclude this episode by briefly going over this set of reading skills, which are outlined in their historical thinking chart under the headings of sourcing, contextualization, corroboration, and close reading. Before we get into these four historical reading skills, I'd just like to augment our earlier discussion about what history is and how it's different from the past by drawing upon some further details provided by the Stanford History Education Group and with which I'm in total agreement. First, history isn't the past itself, but rather an account of the past. And we all may have our own accounts of particular events, and every one of those accounts is going to differ depending upon each individual, per each individual person's personal perspective. And as we do history or engage in the practice of constructing accounts of the past, especially when we aren't direct eyewitnesses, we rely upon evidence in order to construct our accounts. Much like a detective or prosecutor pulls together evidence to build a case, historians build accounts of the past on evidence. And we're careful with all of that evidence, questioning the reliability of each individual piece and not just jumping to conclusion based on just one item of evidence alone. And wherever possible, we construct plausible accounts of the past by drawing upon multiple strands of strong and reliable evidence that all serve to corroborate the overall version of events. This means that history isn't just a telling of the past, but a critical endeavor. And the bread and butter of history is documentary evidence. And as we construct new accounts of the past, we often seek to synthesize or bring together into a coherent whole multiple pre-existing accounts that represent multiple perspectives and different sides to a particular story or event that happened in the past. Good historians carefully employ critical historical thinking as we do this. As we evaluate documentary evidence, it's very useful to explicitly or clearly think through the four historical reading skills outlined in the historical thinking chart. The first of these is sourcing, which is all about the source and the document that we're assessing. Imagine that we find a new manuscript telling us about some event in world history in order to exercise the sourcing skill, we'd ask ourselves a number of key questions. Who wrote this document? When was it written? Where was it written? What do we know about the author? And what does that information tell us about their particular perspective? And what do all the answers to all of these questions tell us about the document's potential reliability? The second historical reading skill is closely connected to the first, and we call this one contextualization, which is all about the when and the where in which the document was created, and what the wider contextual details of that when and where might mean for how we understand the document. Of particular interest here 
is trying to understand how the particular circumstances in which the document was created might affect its content. And here we're really interested in the social structure, political system, economic conditions, physical environment, religious beliefs and practices, and how the document's author and subject matter fit into this wider context. And we also need to be particularly careful here in not reading and interpreting the document from our own context, as there may very well be some substantial differences between our particular context and the then and the there in which the document was originally written. The third historical reading skill acknowledges that we cannot really construct a plausible and reliable account by just accepting the point of view presented in one document alone. What we do in this reading skill is seeking out corroboration or supporting evidence that backs up the details and or overall story that our main document presents. And to exercise this skill, we actively seek out wider information and as many accounts of the same event, time, or set of circumstances as possible. And we see what those other documents have to say. We ask and investigate through careful analysis whether or not different documents agree. And when they don't, we seek out explanations for why they might seem to contradict each other. We also build upon all of these skills to pull them together to make judgments about which documents are the most reliable, and in some cases, why particular portions of documents might be more reliable, even if other portions of that same document are not. And our final historical reading skill focuses in on the details, recognizing that details matter and employing what we call close reading to pull out insights that superficial reading might overlook. So rather than just skim through and observe that the author says X, we would pay careful attention to all of the claims that the author makes in establishing their narrative. And we look for specific evidence too. If the author says that someone was a crook, do they provide particular examples of that person's supposed crookedness? Do they have any particular bias? And yes, every author is going to have some bias. Whether or not it's stated or easy to identify, it's still there. But how can the document's particular language help us to identify and understand their perspective? In what particular language and here I mean words, phrases, images, and or symbols does the author use to persuade his or her audience? And do these symbols or phrases come from somewhere else? And if so, how might these borrowings or cultural allusions matter? Now, if you're in one of my history courses, we'll absolutely be working through these various historical thinking skills throughout the course. So you'll need to get familiar with them. Please recognize that while they're all presented here and in the historical thinking chart as separate things, they are deeply intertwined and absolutely do bleed into each other, sometimes more so with different documents than with others. Now, some struggles that students in introductory courses frequently face is not having enough historical knowledge to feel confident in saying things about document sources and the specific context in which certain documents are produced. And the close reading scale is often seen as some sort of arcane art. Don't worry. This is totally normal. As with any scale, the more practice you put in, the more you'll improve and the greater confidence you'll be able to develop. Historical knowledge comes from just learning more, paying attention in lectures, and most important, wide reading. 
And as you do the reading for your history courses, indeed for any course I'd say, try to get into the habit of asking some of the key questions that align with each of these historical reading skills. Over time, you'll find that it'll start to come naturally. You'll understand your reading better and you'll develop much greater critical awareness that's going to serve you well in whatever subject area, even outside of history, that you're working in. So let's quickly recap. History is not the same thing as the past. The past is a unit of time that contains everything and every moment that has ever existed or happened from the very beginning of time all the way up to this very moment. History is humanity's documentation of the past. It's not just the people who do remarkable things that make history, but anyone who is involved in the documentation of the past or present can be seen as making contributions to humanity's documentation of the past or history. Beyond just this documentation, though, history is also a way of studying the past in order to create new accounts of the past, primarily using documentary evidence. And accounts of the past, whether they're written at the same time as the events that they talk about or written later, they aren't free of bias but they represent a selective telling that is shaped by the author's own perspective in the context of when, where, and why they are writing. And as historians work to assess documentary evidence from the past in order to write our own accounts, we seek to employ a critical perspective that weighs each piece of evidence and builds up accounts using the most reliable evidence from as many streams and perspectives as possible, exercising those historical thinking or reading skills of sourcing, contextualization, corroboration, and close reading. When we take all of this into account, history isn't just a boring subject of dates and names but a fascinating critical exercise in which we draw upon and evaluate the past because of its deep connections to our current present. Now that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for watching or listening. I hope that you found this useful. If so, please like, subscribe, and or share, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast. If you're on YouTube and have any questions, please feel free to leave those in the comments below or contact me via email or social media. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Bye.